I'm Chris Sims. And I'm Franco Terzano. This is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. In Deep Dive, we're going to take a look at the specter of wealth taxes in Canada as the Trudeau government searches for more taxpayers' money while they spend it as fast as they possibly can. And in Waste Watch, we have yet another example of the Governor General wasting our tax dollars. But first, Franco, my province of British Columbia is in the middle of an election right now, and the BC Liberals are promising a PST holiday here for a year. You know, we push politicians to lower taxes, but I can't remember, actually, the last time a major political party promised to completely eliminate a major tax like the PST. Please tell me, what's it like in Alberta to not have a PST? You mean, what's it like to not have to pay a sales tax every time I go to the store? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's pretty great. It's pretty great. I mean, you know, letting more people keep more of their own money seems like a no-brainer and a great way to help people during this economic downturn. Now, let me play a clip for you from Alberta Premier Jason Kenney, who smacked down a question about a sales tax. I I cannot imagine a dumber thing to do in the midst of a time of economic fragility, a oil price collapse, and a global recession than to add a multi-billion dollar tax on the Alberta economy, on Alberta families that would cost, you know, uh, you're talking about a a PST. that would generate several billion dollars of revenue, that would take several thousand dollars out of the pockets of Alberta families at the worst possible time. What we need now is fiscal stimulus, uh, not fiscal suppression. Oh, okay. Yeah, I agree. I can't think of a dumber idea than Alberta to have a PST. Well, here in British Columbia, our PST is on nearly everything other than groceries. I mean, cleaning supplies, clothes, cars, natural gas, internet, cell phones, appliances. And to really dig the heel into it, even things like used cars and used clothes. So if you're low income and you're trying to save dough, uh, you pay through the nose on the PST. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, whenever I have friends or family visiting from out of province, yeah, they always stock up before having to go back (laughs) home and paying that provincial sales tax. And you know, all of this reminds me of a story back from the early 2000s when the BC government tried to force Costco's in Alberta to give them the names and addresses of BC shoppers. Well, you know what Costco said? Yeah, they rightly told the government of BC to go shove it. (laughs) Now, Chris, we're talking about this great proposal on the PST out in BC, but I've heard that there's another proposal about the government monopoly car insurance out there. Can you explain that? Yeah, for sure. So we have something called ICBC out here in British Columbia. It is a monopoly. It is government forced auto insurance. You have no choice. You can't shop around. And on top of that, we pay the highest rates in all of Canada. So we get really badly screwed here on our auto insurance in BC. Now you guys in Alberta, you pay way less in auto insurance. In fact, I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day and he pays less for his two cars just outside of Edmonton than I pay for one car here in BC. It's awful. So Chris, what you're saying is that because a major party is promising more competition for car insurance, that's kind of a big deal out there. It is a huge deal. And just speaking, you know, as a British Columbian born and raised, it's like a cultural thing out here. For some reason, there are some strange hangups here about ICBC. Like people have Stockholm syndrome to an extent. So when we start suggesting saying, hey, how about we allow adults to shop around for their own car insurance, just like they do for cell phones and groceries and stuff. We actually have people worrying that we won't have like speed enforcement or road safety programs or driver's licenses. Do you have that stuff in Alberta? Well, I mean, we (laughs) might not have a provincial sales tax, but yeah, we still have driver's licenses out here in Alberta. Um, But seriously, you guys, you guys could benefit from our example here in Alberta, right? I mean, um, open competition for insurance, just like more competition and choice in all industries is a good thing. And us not having a provincial sales tax, I mean, that saves taxpayers in Alberta billions of dollars every single year. For sure. And just when you do an apples to apples comparison, and there's many studies, uh, you guys pay way less on your car insurance than we do here for the same car, same driver, same reasons. So 
we're hopeful that these sort of ideas catch on here in BC. So speaking of costs and taxpayers getting soaked for all we're worth, the Trudeau government federally is sending out all kinds of crazy signals that they're going to impose a wealth tax on Canadians soon. There's also some talk about a wealth tax in Saskatchewan. So our Prairie Director Todd McKay is going to do a deep dive with Ontario Director Jasmine Moulton on that right now. It's time for Deep Dive. We're going to get deeper into important issues. And we've got Jasmine Moulton here. She's our Ontario director. Jasmine, we need to talk about the wealth tax. Well, politicians like to try to convince Canadians that wealth taxes won't hit them. It'll only affect billionaires. But those politicians keep moving the target. Farmers, small business owners, and even people who have paid off their mortgage should be worried. Yeah, anytime you see the government, uh, quote unquote, taxing the other guy, you should be watching your uh, mailbox for a tax bill coming soon. But let's get into the specifics. What kind of proposals are we looking at here in Canada? As our listeners will know, right now, the NDP is propping up the federal liberal government because it's a minority government situation. And the NDP House leader, Peter Julian, said that their next policy priority is to work with the liberals on passing a wealth tax. In its 2019 platform, we saw that the NDP pledged that they were going to put a 1% wealth tax on wealth exceeding 20 million bucks. But in June of this year, the Taxpayers Federation noticed that the NDP significantly broadened the application of its original wealth tax plan by lowering the threshold from $20 million down to $6.1 million, which is a pretty steep jump. The NDP hasn't explicitly admitted that though. They've just changed the wording to say that now they're targeting Canada's top 1% instead of the $20 million mark. But as the parliamentary budget officer pointed out, that threshold is at 6.1 million. That's the amount of wealth you need to be in Canada's 1%. So the NDP is trying to pull a fast one here, but the reality is that they've significantly lowered the bar. Well, again, this is the thing about taxes. Remember the income tax. That was supposed to be a temporary tax to pay for World War I. It was only going to hit the top highest percentages of, of people in terms of income. How's that worked out? We've all been paying uh, the income tax for almost a century now. So, Jasmine, let's talk to average Joe Canadian taxpayer here. How concerned should folks be about a wealth tax? The average person in Canada should be concerned about a wealth tax, regardless of the amount of personal wealth they have, for two reasons. First, way more people than you think are going to be affected by this wealth tax. And secondly, it is going to target investment into businesses, meaning that if you have a job or you know someone in your family who has a job, uh, we know that in business investment is basically, you know, the fuel that keeps our economy going. And if the government's going to take a chunk out of business investment every year, that should concern everyone. Yeah, you might as well put out a press release uh, telling Canadian investors that they'd be better off moving their money somewhere else. But for our listeners, wealth tax, this is not like an income tax. The calculation is going to be different. What would this look like? How, what, is, what kind of paperwork do they have to do to figure out whether they'd get hit by a, a, the wealth tax? You're right, Todd. Probably a lot of listeners listening to the show right now don't even know what their net wealth is. But this is the way that the government would calculate it. And I should actually point out as well that the name wealth tax itself is fairly misleading. In reality, what this is, is an asset tax. And here's why. The way that the government defines wealth is by subtracting your liabilities, which would be like a mortgage or uh, credit uh, consumer debt from your assets. And this is where our listeners should really listen up because assets include real estate assets, and also financial assets, which can include pensions and investments. So in reality, they're taxing your net assets. And Todd, that's bad policy, whether those assets are earning you income or not. Yeah, that's actually a really big problem we're going to get into here in just a minute. But why don't you give us a few examples so we can sort of visualize what this would look like? Well, let's take word from our New Zealand counterparts, the New Zealand Taxpayers Union. Here's a clip. 
At their cause, wealth taxes are envy taxes. They unfairly penalize the products of decisions made before a tax was introduced and punish people for success. A retiree under this scheme might lose a third of his or her assets during retirement. The result is that you end up with fewer successful people to pay taxes and employ others. There's another practical problem. Wealth taxes don't bring in a lot of money. Taxpayers shuffle their assets to avoid them or take their money offshore altogether. And complex requirements to annually value assets are a dream for tax accountants who can charge big money to obtain favorable valuations and minimize liabilities. As we just heard, the New Zealand Taxpayers Union points out that its wealth tax could take up to a third of retirees' assets. That's a lot of money. And in New Zealand, the Green Party is demanding a wealth tax that starts at a million bucks, and that's in New Zealand dollars, which would be about 880000 in Canadian dollars. Not a very high threshold, especially when you consider the average household in Toronto itself is about uh, $1.5 million right now. And the crazy part, and this should be a warning to all Canadians, is that the New Zealand uh, Green Party, their proposal for a wealth tax would hit 6% of the population. So this also includes a family's personal residence, which should alarm everyone. The New Zealand Greens want to impose their wealth tax on families who have worked hard to pay off their mortgages and put away some retirement savings. But retirees aren't the only surprising target on this list. Todd, you and I have talked at length about another surprising target that uh, should be listening up in Canada, and that's farmers. Yeah, it's funny. We both grew up working on the farm. I, my first job was feeding pigs at my uncle's uh, farm. You spent a lot of time uh, on on the farm, family farm as well. Dairy, thankfully, not pigs. <laughs> well, yeah, at five o'clock in the morning when it's milking time, uh, sometimes having a pig farm <laughs> sounds pretty good. But listen, uh, farms are asset heavy. You know, you've got to make your living on the land. You got to be make your living using machinery. And that stuff is expensive. Combines run for over 200 grand easily. Tractors, a couple hundred grand, no problem. And then you look at what land prices have done. Our land may or may not be producing bigger crops than they did a few years ago, but land prices have gone way up. So if you take a look at an RM map, it's not hard to find uh, some families that are very likely right in the crosshairs of a wealth tax, especially if you set that limit at 6 million. There's a ton of you know farm families that would get hammered by a wealth tax. Absolutely. And this is the problem when the government says that they want to start taxing assets. There are so many businesses, uh, farmers, as we mentioned, but retailers as well, that their business depends on you know, they make money off of the assets that they have. So if the government wants to start taking chunks of these assets every year, you know, a 1% chunk every year, it's not very long before, uh, you know, those businesses are really, really hurting. Yeah. And there's some fundamental unfairness here. When you compare folks who make a lot of money, doctors, lawyers, those kind of folks, big monthly paychecks versus people who make their living with assets like land and, and equipment. So I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you've got a, a farm kid here in Saskatchewan, plays hockey, does really well, makes it to the NHL. Let's say he's got a good head on his shoulder, puts half a million bucks in the bank, saves half a million bucks every year for a five-year career. That kid probably doesn't pay a dime in wealth taxes because his money's coming in, not from assets, but from his contract and uh, getting on the ice, playing in the NHL. Let's say his little sister takes over the family farm. The farm's been in the family for three generations. You know, people have been working hard to pay that land off for a long time. She could easily get dinged by a wealth tax every single year, right from day one. Big brother in the NHL, no wealth tax. Little sister on the farm, taking it on the chin every year. And here's the real killer. Even if, let's say there's a crop failure, let's say hail wipes out a crop, drought wipes out the crop, frost hits at harvest time, all kinds of things can go wrong on the farm. Let's say she doesn't have any crop, no cash flow at all, doesn't matter. Here comes the bill for the wealth tax. It's really unfair. Think about that for others too. A lot of businesses out here right now across Canada, around the world, are having a real tough time with cash flow because of the pandemic. Building is still worth money. Equipment's still worth money. 
but there's no cash flow coming in yet still. A wealth tax would hammer those folks. It's a really unfair tax. That's clear. And it's clear that it's going to hurt a lot of Canadians uh, from retirees to, to business owners, to ordinary families. But what isn't clear is if this would actually work. Would the wealth tax in Canada actually generate enough revenue to help the government, you know, dig itself out of this hole? And Todd, this is the crazy part. They have no idea if this would work. The parliamentary budget officer admitted that its modeling is highly uncertain. And the key word there is modeling. It used synthetic data. So this isn't even, you know, coming through the CRA returns from last year. These are models saying that they think this might happen, but it's very, very uncertain. Well, for sure. There's so much uncertainty in this case. If you're imposing a wealth tax on Canadian investors, you might as well put it like this. We're going to give you a penalty if you invest here. You make a bonus if you move to Miami. That's really what they're saying. And there's no way to know what what the kind of impact that could have on the economy generally, what that would do to uh, revenues. They're really rolling the dice here. But okay, let's leave all of that aside here. Let's look at what the NDP projections look like. What are they hoping a wealth tax would generate? For their original plan, which was to tax 1% of wealth over 20 million, the parliamentary budget officer said that that might to bring in on average about 7 billion bucks a year for the next 10 years. But even if that's true, which is highly uncertain, Todd, that's a drop in the bucket. That's about 2% right now of the federal government's deficit this year, meaning that the deficit will only add 336 billion to the debt instead of 343 billion this year. Not a big difference. Uh, 7 billion wouldn't even cover the cost of interest on the federal government's debt every year. And this is the crazy part. Given how much the federal government is currently spending, which is close to $1 billion per day, they would burn through the revenue generated by the wealth tax in one week. That's so crazy. You know, you, you're looking at a huge new tax Big implications for the family farm, small businesses across the board in the economy. You would have to hire thousands of new bureaucrats at the uh, Canadian Revenue Agency to try to enforce this tax, to check everybody's numbers. You know, did the farmer count all the grain in the bin uh, for the assets? You'd have all of those expenses, all of that uncertainty, and you don't even cover a week's worth of the bills. This is not an actual solution for Canada's economic problems. No, absolutely not. And another crazy part about this is that the the parliamentary budget officer did say, you know what, people will probably change their behavior if we implement a wealth tax. So let's account for that, uh, just so that we can calculate how much revenue this will actually bring in. So they did that for the wealth tax. They slapped on what they said, a 35% estimated behavioral response rate just so that they could figure out how much revenue the wealth tax itself would bring in. But what's completely missing from their analysis is how much other tax revenues might decline as a result of, for example, the flight of capital out of Canada. So this really is not a comprehensive report. Like we said, if let's say the wealth tax brings in 7 billion, but they lose billions more in another area, then really this is not effective and they haven't measured that at all. And in their defense, it really is almost impossible to measure. It's purely theoretical at this point. But thankfully, instead of trying to build out, you know, model after model to figure out, would this work? Canada can look to Europe. So there were about 12 European countries in the 1990s that implemented wealth taxes, and nine out of 12 of them quickly ditched them due to low revenues, high administrative costs, and also they saw the flight of wealth out of their countries. So Canada already has its answer from all of these European examples. Wealth taxes don't work. Yeah, it's incredible. Sweden had a wealth tax. A lot of, uh, a lot of investors left the country. They said, man, we got to turn this off. France lost uh, thousands of people moving to places like Switzerland to avoid uh, France's wealth tax. You know, it's interesting, India bailed out on the, the wealth tax as well. And even in New Zealand, 
where the labor government, the left-leaning labor government, sort of equivalent to our liberal government here in Canada, that labor government is propped up by the Greens. The Greens in New Zealand are demanding that wealth tax starting at about a million dollars, which would hammer just about anybody who's paid off their home and put away some, uh, some retirement plans. But even that labor government in New Zealand is saying, nope, we've looked at the wealth tax. It doesn't work. It's unfair and massively difficult to administer. We don't want to go there. That really tells you something uh, and should be a real warning to people about where the, uh, the NDP is trying to push the, the uh, Trudeau government. Um, because there are huge economic consequences of decisions like this that the government doesn't even seem to understand at this point. Well, the reality of the situation is that governments are in quite a deep financial hole. COVID-19 has really torn through budgets and left, you know, a lot of destruction in its wake. So it is true that government, you know, have are in a dire financial situation right now. Really, we need serious solutions uh, to fix this. We can't just continue to pass this debt onto, you know, our kids' kids and onto future generations. But Todd, the wealth tax is not a serious solution. As we pointed out earlier, it would be burned through in a matter of days in this government. The real solution is that politicians need to get their spending under control. And to end on a high note, I will (laughs) quote Winston Churchill, who said, for a nation to tax itself into prosperity is like a man standing in a bucket trying to lift himself up by the handle. Hi. I'm Scott Hennig, president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Sorry for interrupting the podcast, but I wanted to take a few seconds of your time to tell you more about the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. We are 235,000 Canadians from coast to coast that are fed up. We are fed up with politicians taking too much out of our paychecks, often to waste it on a bunch of pet projects, corporate welfare, and pork barreling to buy votes. We organize campaigns to push back on these politicians. These campaigns often include petition drives, billboards, media stunts, and more. But most importantly, they ask our supporters to pitch in and take action. Alone, we're a voice in the wilderness. Together, we're an army to be reckoned with. You can join the fight and sign up at no cost at taxpayer.com. That website again is taxpayer.com. Okay, now back to the podcast. It's time for Waste Watch. This is when we make fun of dumb things that governments are spending your money on. Franco, what do you have for us today? Well, we have another story about the Governor General burning taxpayers. And this time, taxpayers were forced to fork over nearly $650,000 on Governor General Julie Payette's over-the-top swearing-in ceremony that took place back in 2017. And this story was first broke by Black Locks reporter. Now get this, $650,000, but that meant that the feds went over their original budget by 150 grand. Okay, that's nuts. That is a huge amount of money to be spending on one ceremony. This is a crazy cost. But the original budget, $500,000, half a million for the swearing in ceremony is bananas on its own. But what I'm wondering is how did they manage to overspend that budget? Well, I mean, the feds put together a thousand person event at Parliament Hill and then a 2000 person (sighs) evening cocktail party. Uh, Sounds like fun, Uh, but really no expense seems to have been spared. You know, they had musicians being carted in. They had military jets flying overhead and then they spent tens of thousands of dollars on food and drink. So it really sounds like what a night to be a bureaucrat in, uh, in Ottawa. Now, here's a crazy one. Taxpayers even spent 1500 so Payette could sign her name into Canada's official guest book. 1500 bucks, Chris. Now that's crazy, but here might be the craziest part. The extra spending, some of the extra spending actually had to be approved by then Canadian Heritage Minister Melanie Jolie. So some politician actually had to look at this and thought that this was a good use of taxpayers' dollars. 
that's just mind blowing because every now and then you can say, oh, well, if it was just one person's decision and it fell off the desk, you can say, well, it's dumb, but it was a mistake. No, the other eyeballs actually looked at this and said, yeah, let's put a check mark next to this. This is an outrageous amount of spending. I was actually reading and apparently the military fly past that cost of around $30,000 isn't included in this $650,000 tab. Apparently that was quote unquote paid for by D and D, you know, between the monarchist leagues in Canada and all the people who love the armed forces, they could have had a really respectful, lovely swearing in ceremony for a fraction of this cost on parliament Hill. It's crazy that my tax dollars paid for a party that I wasn't invited to. I know lots of taxpayers feel exactly the same, but the one that's sticking in my head, is $1,500 so Payette could sign her name? Like, how does that even work? How do you spend 1500 bucks on signing your name? Yeah, we paid for her coat of arms to be hand-painted into the guest book, along with a professionally done signature. And uh, get this, we also had to pay for redos for some reason. Okay, this sounds like the onion. Okay, this is not the first time, by the way, that swearing in ceremonies for governor generals have cost ridiculous amounts of money. Just for reference, the swearing in ceremony for David Johnston in 2010, that one cost just over $210,000. While Adrienne Clarkson, she's a repeat winner of the Teddy Waste Award, her swearing in ceremony cost $450,000. That was back in 1999. And the most expensive was Mikael Jean back in 2005. Her swearing in ceremony somehow cost $1.3 million. Yeah, this is absolutely crazy. And like, come on, we can't be spending tax dollars this type of money on these swearing in parties. I mean, really, we need to see spending cuts uh, moving forward, especially with these this hundreds of billions of dollars massive deficit that we have. And this type of spending moving forward really has to be the low hanging fruit. And, and if, you, if you want to read more about this, like, don't worry, we're going to include the links in the show notes so you can read up on, on all the extra details. And uh, yeah, we're going to keep a close eye out. We absolutely will, because we can't keep doing this going forward. Like we said, there's a way of being respectful and honoring a service and ceremony at a fraction of this cost. Well, there you have it. There's the show. And hey, thanks again for listening to the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. And a huge thank you to our investigative journalist and our editor, James Wood, for editing the show and uh, making it sound like we actually make sense. <laughs> Be sure to subscribe and tell your buddies about this podcast. Catch you next week. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, President of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening, and thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.